Uh, okay, so uh, our next speaker is uh, Greg Cafori. Uh, uh, Greg is a guardian of civil justice, member of uh, OLA. He began his career in civil rights worker in the South in 1965. He continues to be a leader in Oregon's uh, progressive community, handling many tort cases for political activists. Uh, pretty much every Saturday morning, I open the paper up, and Kafori, McDougal, and Kafori have just won another huge case. It seems like every Saturday I read that. Um, and uh, he's just a great attorney. Um, so, how's that, Greg? <coughs> Not, not, not that good? Want more? <laughs> He's a strong, strong trial lawyer. Yeah. Fabulously entertaining. I'll cut it off. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's give him a hand. Now, the subject I was given was uh, direct examination. Um, Beth Creighton uh, watched a court TV show that uh, had one of my cases a long time ago. And she uh, uh, got me invited to uh, show a video clip and to talk about uh, that particular uh, examination. I got a call at my office, and a woman said that uh, she'd been injured in a uh, in an incident at the airport where uh, she'd been giving a ticket to a guy because he wouldn't move his car. She was a parking control representative. And she said that uh, the guy cursed her, he grabbed her, got in his car, drove into her, hit her, backed up, hit her again, knocked her up on the hood of the car, drove some distance, got out, switched seats with his wife, tried to get away by uh, getting a taxi, and uh, th th that she was hurt. And I said, well, do you have any reason to think that a guy who would act like that has the resources to make it worth suing him? And she said, well, the police tell me that he's a brain surgeon. And I said, well, let me look at my busy schedule and <laughs> see if I can find the time to squeeze you in. <laughs> And that uh, became the case of um, June Gritman versus uh, Daryl Bratt. Uh, during the midst of the direct examination of uh, June Gritman, I rather spontaneously decided uh, to use a technique I had uh, heard about, never in a trial context, but a, a technique that is designed to help people recover detailed memories when they're having a tough time doing it. And that technique is that, is that you ask them to, uh, uh, as much as they can, return to the time and the place and to have a sense of that time and that place and then uh, relate what happens. Um, play the video, please. You all ready? OK. Now, I want you to do something with me. I want you to hold together. Okay. All right? You a tough girl, like everybody says? All right, you show me. I want you to take yourself back. to where we left off yesterday. You were grabbed, you broke loose, you were threatened, the man got in the car. I want you to feel the imprint of his arms on your, of his hands on your arms. I want you to feel the jacket. I want you to remember the temperature. I want you to have a sense of what you were wearing. I want you to remember the lights. I want you to go back there with me. And I want you to tell me 
as it happens, every single thought that goes through your head, can you do that? Yes. He slammed the car door. What are you thinking? What happens, June? He, he slams the car door. The motor starts. Come on, get through it. Then he goes forward. He hits me. How do you feel? In disbelief. I couldn't believe that he could do something like that. What do you think? I'm thinking, why? Why? Then he backs up. Goes forward again, hits me again. Tell me everything. I end up on the hood. You know how? No. How do you feel? I feel I'm going down the airport away. I didn't know when he was going to stop or if he was going to stop. How are your feet? My feet are being dragged underneath. What's going to happen to him? I'm going to fall off. Then what? <laughs> then he's going to run over me. Where's your belt? <laughs> I didn't hear you. Where's your belt? My belt's on the hood ornament. I can't get it off. Excuse me, Your Honor. Can I take the medal before this time? Can we take five minutes? stopped? It does eventually stop. What are you thinking? I'm thinking he, I'm hoping that he will leave it stop so I could get off the hood. What do you do? <laughs> as soon as it stops and he turns the motor off, I get off the hood. How are you feeling? Scared. <laughs> and I hurt. Linda there? Linda's there. She's been there the whole time. Have she, you heard her? She's been yelling all the time. What was she yelling? Stop. Put it in park. Turn the motor off. Stop. Do you remember the man getting out of the car? Yes, I do. How long did he stay in the car before he got out? I don't know. Maybe a minute or two. Remember what Linda said to him? Don't cry yet, honey. Do you remember that? Well, I'm going to object to this thing. Jurors disregard that statement. Mrs. Griffin is how you should have read it. Do you remember what she said? To him? To you. To me, she says, are you okay? She says, she says, don't cry yet. And I said, I'm trying not to. What did the man say when he got out of the car? He goes up to Linda and he says, I want to apologize. Did you believe him? He went up to Linda. He didn't come up to me, he went up to Linda. She says, it's kind of late for that. What happens next? Then he gets back in the car. Then what? <laughs> then he gets out again. His passenger gets out, she walks around behind. And he starts taking off. What'd you do? I couldn't believe he was doing that. Where I do called Robert. Going? I didn't know where he was going. You called Robert? I called the other PCR. Where were you when you did it? On the, standing by the car, holding on to it. And had Robert following. And then the lady got into the driver's seat. What'd you think? I thought she was going to start up and go. What happened next? Then the paramedics came. What did they do for you? 
they helped me over to the bench and Could you walk? No. They basically carried me over there. What are you doing at the bench? They're cutting my pants off, checking my knees. How are you feeling? I'm hurt bad. Remember Dr. Brett being coming back? I remember seeing him there and I told him not to let him get near me. Did you keep him away? <laughs> Paramedics stood in between me and him and he told him to be with the police officers. Remember the ambulance ride? Yes. What are you thinking? I was just glad to get away from there. Do you ever dream about it? All the time. What happens? I'm going down airport way. On the hood of the car? On the hood of the car. How fast is it going? Fast. What's going to happen to you? I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm sorry. You all right? Drink some water. She's a very compelling witness during her direct examination. She doesn't gild the lily. She tells it like it was for her and only gets emotional at a point when one could expect her to get emotional. It's also a tribute to the skills of this plaintiff's lawyer because what he does so well is he keeps everything in the present tense. He makes it come alive in the courtroom and at each step of the way he asks her questions like, what is happening now? What are you thinking? He asks her, how are you feeling? So it all becomes real for her and for the jury. It's very good work. A friend of mine uh, called me. He saw this on the East Coast uh, the first time it ran, before I did. And he was gushing about the reception uh, that I received from the commentators. And, and he said, my god, Greg, he said, a star is born. We won. Uh, 200,000 in compensation, 800,000 in punitive damages, and uh, I was feeling very good about myself for a very long time. Um, about a year later, I went to the airport uh, in a taxi, and uh, I was uh, bragging. I told the taxi driver that, uh, you know, I'm the guy that had that case for June Gritman, the parking control representative, who got uh, run over by the brain surgeon here. And he said, oh, yeah. I said, I remember that case. Yeah, we, we talked about that case. Really? He, says, he said, you know what? He said, I was on a mock jury before that trial. I said, you're kidding. No, really. I was on this mock jury. I guess it was the defense that was doing it. I didn't know at the time. I said, really? I said, well, uh, you know, how'd the plaintiff do? She said, uh, that guy said, uh, oh, the plaintiff won. I said, well, how much? He said, $35 million. <laughs> I had a case uh, where I didn't like the defense lawyer, and uh, and he I, I had I had a lady who was who was badly hurt in an accident, an ordinary car wreck. She didn't get better, and he was asking her questions about, you know, does it really hurt that much? And after all, you go gardening and your back hurts. And did it ever occur to you if you lost a little weight, maybe you'd uh, it wouldn't hurt so bad and so on. And a final argument, I went after him and I said, you know. What did she do? What did she do to deserve this? What did she do to get hurt? What did she do to not be able to recover? What did she do to have some 20-something lawyer calling her a fake and a liar and a fatty? And the jury came back with $150,000, which 25 years ago was an enormous sum of money for such a case. And uh, I heard a report a few days later from someone who knew the defense lawyer, and the guy said, God, man, he said, I, I, I just don't know. I mean, I, I tried the case the same. I, I've tried a lot of cases, and I've always done really, really well. And, and uh, Kafori, man, I mean, he, he, he's an artist. I mean, he just, he, just, he just killed me. I tell you, I don't see how I can keep on doing these cases. I just feel like, I, like I've lost my confidence. It was, it was just devastating to me to, to, to suffer such a defeat. And. Uh, what I didn't tell him is that I talked to one of the jurors. 
And the juror had told me, he said, well, you know, Kafour, he said, the jury didn't like what you said about that other lawyer. And, uh, but I told them I'd had a chronic back pain. I said, you know, you can't imagine, I said to them, what it's like. It's just the worst thing you can happen. And I just beat on those people till they gave your client all that money. But at the very end, a whole bunch of the jurors said, well, can we give her all that money? Can, can we put in the verdict form that lawyer doesn't get any of it? <laughs> I told the lawyer who was so depressed over his performance, I told him that story about six months ago. <laughs> I didn't want him to get his mojo back. Um, what we do is really political, and we need to recognize that. And I want to talk about politics for a minute. You know, we had a president in the 30s and 40s who called out the, uh, the very rich and, and denounced them and told, uh, told uh, the nation how he, how he embraced their hatred. And then uh, things changed, you know. Uh, in the 1960s, we had a resurgence of, of people who cared about justice. But uh, by the 1980s, I had a very brilliant young law student who um, uh, worked for us for a little while. And he said to me, as I understand it, uh, you know, Lawyers like to be made a plaintiff's lawyer for a few years and then just switch and go become defense lawyers. And I was stunned. He, he belonged to a generation which had, which had lost its whole sense of, of, of ideology, of struggle. And this seemed like a reasonable question to him. Um, now here we are. We have a black president who uh, never met a banker he didn't like. And we could... We could forgive some young lawyers for, for not remembering what Clarence Darrow told us, which is that every lawsuit at its heart is class struggle. The defense doesn't know that. They don't understand it. That's why defense lawyers, with their belief that you know, law is an intellectual exercise, that everyone's entitled to a good defense, and all this kind of nonsense, they do, they do things which, which make no sense. I, I, I had a police case where my client had been savagely beaten and, and he had PTSD and the defense lawyer left on a clinical psychologist who did all of her testimony, which was considerable, for criminal defendants. Left him on a jury. Uh, we had a, uh, a, a terrible uh, industrial accident and, uh, and the defense left on a, uh, a union organizer who you know, said to me later, I can't believe they left me on the jury. We had a case where, where a, uh, uh, a young black woman had been uh, terribly treated, badly damaged by, by a large corporation. Defense left on a guy who, who was a, a union official in a strong arm union who was, I swear to God, a dead ringer for Malcolm X. I heard him bellowing half a courthouse away at some recalcitrant juror in the jury room. He wasn't going to let that little girl be uh, pushed around by some juror. Um, so whereas we are, and we need to see ourselves as, warriors for justice, warriors against inequality, and, and, and in this struggle against, against oppression and, and injustice, we need to find the heart of justice in every case. If it's a car wreck, you've got somebody who's encouraged to lie by a defense lawyer. You've got witnesses who are, who are professional liars brought in by a company that has a bag full of them. We have to find ways to get this across. You should always ask for the instruction about, about insurance. Say, you know, tell the jurors in voir dire, you're going to get instructed that whether or not there's insurance in this case is something we're not allowed to tell you, if you get what I mean. <laughs> the, You have to explain to your, to, to, to your client what the case is about, because a lot of them kind of don't understand what we're really doing here. And you know, the, first, the, the, the direct examination of your client, which is the most important witness, it begins, of course, with, with, with the deposition, with your preparation for the deposition. Because if they make an unsympathetic presentation, if they hit a false note, it can, it can take them down. So explain to them, you know, this is a struggle for information. 
It's like a card game where you know, you're know you gonna choose which of your cards you're gonna play. Don't show them your cards. That way, at the end, we get rid of our bad cards and play the good ones, all right? They wanna see your cards. Don't let them. So I'll say, well, how do I do that? Well, three rules. Listen to the question they ask, answer the question they ask, stop talking. Fill the room with your silence. If you're saying more than two or three sentences, you're screwing up, and I'm gonna let you know it. Listen to the question. Every question has a word in it that makes it a question. The reporter's words, who, what, where, when. Listen for that question and give us the answer. And if they say, do you have any relatives who live in the area? The answer is yes or no. It's not, well, I have a cousin in Cincinnati, but you know, we haven't talked since he caught me poisoning his dog. <laughs> Tell them about bad examples, about how not to answer questions, and uh, you know, scare them a little bit. The, uh, give them examples from your own experience. You know, lecturing is one thing. Giving examples is much more useful. Um, I had uh, I had a case very early on in my thirties um, where. Annette Benton, a, uh, a woman uh, with massive and multiple disabilities, uh, went to, a, uh, to an eye surgeon, an older man, a silver fox, for, for evaluation of, uh, of her eyes for the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. And uh, he pinned her against the wall and he kissed her and he told her that, uh, that if she'd make love to him someday that, uh, uh, that he, would, uh, he would take her fine places and, and spend a lot of money on her. Perhaps someday they might even get married. And uh, she, uh, she was 19, she'd never been asked before. And she went home and she thought about it a lot. And then she called him and said that, that she'd like to do that. So uh, he, uh, he sent a, a taxi to pick her up and uh, took, it, took her to his office on a Saturday. And uh, they had sex on the couch every Saturday for 17 years. And uh, she didn't get pregnant and, and, and then she did. And uh, she went to him and she asked for $100 because she'd heard that sometimes when, when women's gets with men's that, that the man's supposed to give them some money. So she asked for $100 and he said, well, it's not my child. And she said, but doctor, you know you're the only one. And, and he said, and anyway, I, I, I don't have that money. I can't afford it. And he threw her out and he told his secretary that, that she was, uh, her presence was not to be honored again. And. Uh, I filed a lawsuit uh, against the doctor for intentional infliction of emotional distress. And uh, Chuck Paulson, perhaps the, uh, the greatest uh, plaintiff's lawyer in the state of his generation, now a man in his 80s, uh, did something he probably never did again in his life. He was, the, uh, he was a defense lawyer, one of two defense lawyers. And um, I had a woman, the doctor of course denied everything, I had a, a, a woman who had uh, was the daughter of a, a woman, his mother and daughter team. They had a, a, a home for people who had mental illness and retardation and this sort of thing. And uh, Annette uh, and had lived there for a time. And she told the story about how Annette had uh, come to her and said that, uh, that she needed to go to the doctor that day. And could she get a ride? And the woman said, don't be silly. You know, it's a Saturday. <laughs> you don't see, oh, no, the doctor will see me on Saturday. And she said, OK, OK. She drove her there. And she took her to the door and knocked on the door. There's no lights on or anything. And, Doctor answers the door, and uh, and she testified that uh, that she said, uh, "Oh, uh, well, uh, doctor, can I you know can I wait till after the examination? I'll give her right home." And the doctor said, "No, she'll take a taxi." Quietly shut the door, and it was very compelling testimony. Um, and Chuck Paulson cross-examined her, and he said, uh, "When uh, when." Your residents would go to the doctor. Would you would you make a record of it? She said, "Oh yes, we'd always, we'd always write down our record when, when someone went to the doctor." I said, "Well, uh, you still have that record?" She said, "No." We 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 threw it out. I threw it out. Paulson just stared at her. We throw out our records every five years. All of our records. Everyone throws out all their records every five years. Paul said, is that right? Yes, yes, that's true. 
No further questions. Devastating. I tell that story. The woman couldn't shut up. She couldn't learn to just leave it alone. It's OK. Don't get nervous. Don't get drawn in. It's a terrible mistake. Listen to the question. Answer the question. Stop talking. The um, car wreck or you know, similar kind of an incident, go through all the details with your client before the deposition. Don't assume that they can get anything right without your help. I had a lady, I didn't think she was an idiot, but she's driving along and the person turns in front of her and she hits him. Drop dead liability. Defense lawyer says to her, deposition. So you saw the lady when she pulled out across the front of you? Yes, I did. What happened then? Well, I hit her. And he said, how long was it between the time she pulled out in front of you and the time you hit her? And I immediately said to myself, I didn't talk to her about this. And I said, said to my client, I said, think about time. <laughs> and she sat there, I swear to God, for a full minute and finally said, about 30 seconds. <laughs> I took her out of the room. I screamed at her. She fired me. I shouldn't have screamed at her. It was my fault. But, you know, speed, time, distance, where were you? All these things. Spend the time. Dig it out. Take nothing for granted. Analyze your case as if you were a defense lawyer. Look at the weak spots. Know the weak spots. Deal with them. Cases are not won and lost in trial. They're won and lost at deposition. Good cases die in deposition. You have to settle for a fraction of what they're worth because you blew the deposition. Understand what it's like for your client. And talk to them about it. Talk about it. I talk to them about it in these terms. I say, look, it. you're going to really feel nervous. You're in a room. A lawyer is asking you questions. You've taken an oath. There's going to be a court reporter taking stuff down. There may be a videographer recording all your words for time immemorial. You feel like you're in a police station and there's a bulb hanging from the ceiling and they're leaning in on you and they're grilling you and you, you didn't do anything. You're a good person. You want to talk your way out of this. Just let me explain. Exactly wrong. You'd be Willie Sutton. You'd be the great bank robber. You give name, rank, and serial number and you shut the hell up. It's a struggle for information. Don't give them a single fact that they don't ask for. <sighs> historical questions. You got to teach them. For every historical question, never say no. The likelihood is, especially the more specific it is, that they've already got you on it. If they got a record somewhere that shows you were, you were stopped in Medford and had a scene with a police officer. So they ask if you've ever had a bad scene with a police officer. Never, ever, ever say no. If you really don't remember any such scene, just say, not that I recall. Historical questions, never say no. Always say, not that I recall. Talk about it. That's your home base. That's where you're safe. That's what you can cling to. They can't get you when you're there. Protect yourself. Practice it with them. <sighs> Explain to them about remembering more than they remember. People want to plug in the gaps. They want to use their logic. Tell them, say, don't testify about your logic. Hell, I've got logic. I can talk about logic, and I wasn't even there. And you don't remember, and they'll say, they'll say, what do I do if I don't know the answer? Jesus. How about, I don't know. Oh, can I say that? <clears throat> yeah, you can say I don't know. Boy, are they relieved to hear that. You better tell them. People really get panicked in this situation. You're used to it. They're not. Tell them they can say, I don't know. Tell them they can say, I don't recall. And most importantly, tell them that whenever they do, those are three magic words it's a beginning and an end. You never say another word. I don't know is a complete answer. I don't recall is a complete answer. Never explain. Never apologize. And tell them what happens if they do. I don't remember. It's been a long time. Oh, really? 
well, it was a long time since you had this accident, wasn't it? Yeah. And you've told us what happened in the accident. You told us this? Yeah. You told us that? Yeah. You expect us to believe that? Yeah. That was a long time, too, wasn't it? Yeah. Just like that question where you said, it's been a long time and you don't remember. Isn't that true? Yeah. Scare them a little. Let them see what happens when they don't maintain their discipline. Let them know they're free to leave. Tell them to never ask permission to walk out of the room. You just walk out of the room. You take the mic off, you walk out. I'm taking a break. Empower them. Don't ever let them depend on the defense. That's the defense strategy, is to make your client brought under their wing. Interrupt it, stop it, don't let it happen at any level. So when they're ready to leave, just say, you have to give an answer to any pending question. But you know, you don't have to say a lot. You can say, I'm not sure, and take off your mic, come in, we're going to my office. Whenever I get up, we're going to my office. Whenever you get up, we're going to my office, we're going to talk, OK? Simple as that. <sighs> Protect your client during the deposition. This is when you have to be your most active, is when your client is being deposed. If the defense repeats a question, don't just say, you already asked that question, counsel. Tell them what the answer was. No, she didn't, she didn't say 20 miles an hour. She said 40 miles an hour the last time you asked that question. When they misstate a fact. So when you tripped and fell on the sidewalk, interrupt and say, no, she didn't say she tripped. She said she slipped. Get in the answer. Remind them. Don't leave it up to them. If they're trying to put words in your client's mouth, say so. Just look at your client and say, you understand they're trying to put words in your mouth, right? Listen to what they're saying. Don't buy into it just because they say it. They're not your friend, you know. If your client starts to ramble, cut them off. Tell me all the things that happened in the accident. Well, I was walking down the sidewalk, and this person pulled up, and I looked at him. I thought, do they see me or do they don't see me? Should I walk into that front of that car? And I said, Go ahead and interrupt him. Say, don't write a novel. <laughs> or, you know, just say, I was walking across the street and the goddamn car hit me, okay? Just, just say that. Interrupt. Change the tone of things. Most importantly, you want your client to fear you a lot more than they fear the other counsel. You want them to not get hauled out of that room and, 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 and criticize and have their ears boxed. You want them to be paying attention to you and all those directions you gave, all that discipline you imposed on them. You don't want them to be intimidated by the other side. That's how the other side wins. Don't let them get sucked into detail and warn them about it. What was your pain level in March two years ago? They've got the answer, right? Are you going to try and do you have them to memorize the medical records? No, they don't know what their pain level was. I live with pain. I don't try to make a note of it. I try to ignore it, sir. Always keep in mind the distinction between facts and claims. Claims are in the pleadings. Claims are addressed to you. Claims are lawyer matters. Never allow your client to answer a question about what they're claiming. You're claiming $500,000 here. Why do you think you're entitled to $500,000? You can't answer that question. You can't ask that question. You can ask me, counsel, and I won't tell you, OK? <laughs> it's just a claim. Claims are controlled by the pleadings. Closed question. Don't let your client get drawn into any of that stuff. Don't let them answer their opinions. What do you think the defendant did wrong in this case? Objection. Read the complaint again. No, I want to know what your client thinks. You cannot ask my client that. I'm instructing my client not to answer. Because everything my client thinks about this case has been inalterably affected by the communications they've had with their, with, with, with their lawyer, inalterably altered by the facts that I've told them, the discovery that we've made, the investigation that we've made, and their current opinions on anything are accordingly protected by attorney-client. 
never let your client's present opinions be testified to. I've made that objection a thousand times. Nobody's ever bothered to call the court on it to get a ruling because it's right. First thing defense lawyers do at the start of the deposition is try to take control of your client. Don't let him do it. Do you agree to give full and complete answers to every question? Sexton, counsel, you cannot make arrangements, you cannot make deals, you cannot make agreements with my client. You want to make a deal, you talk to me. And don't tell them how to answer questions. They're going to answer questions the way I tell them to answer questions. Do not instruct my client. That's a violation of the attorney-client relationship. Don't try to make deals with my client. That's a violation of the attorney-client relationship. Show them you're not going to get pushed around right out of the gate. Let your client know, as well as the other guy know, who's the boss. If the defense counsel is, for even a moment, demeaning or abusive towards your client, call them on it immediately. Use the words. Warn them. Next time you do that, we're leaving. The deposition is over. You can take the transcript to the judge and try and get it reopened. That will get their attention. There is one, objection, one, one exception to the rule about just answer the question. Listen to the question, answer the question that's asked. If it's a who question, the answer is a person, nothing more. If it's a where question, the answer is a place, nothing more. If it's a when question, the answer is a time or a date, nothing more. The one, except, object, well, one exception to that, the one exception is when they're asked about how the injuries change their life. Now you tell them they can open up like a beautiful flower and just, just talk about it. Talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And to the extent possible, not in generalities. Oh, I used to be an active person. If I hear one more person say they were active, don't tell me you were active. Tell me what you did. I used to walk. Don't just tell me you used to walk. Tell me where you walked. Tell me why you chose that. Tell me what it meant to you. Tell me about what, looking around, about the exercise, about the fresh air, about what it meant to you to be able to do that. Who you walked with, what you talked about. This is their time to get to what you're there for, which is how they've been damaged, how they've been, how they suffered an injustice. Go over it with them. Always reach for the specific over the general, particularly at trial. I had a, uh, a woman whose father was injured. And we were doing a, a, a settlement video. And she said, lovely, lovely young woman. And she said, I've always dreamed of the day I would be married and having my father walk me down the aisle. And now I know that he can never do that. His balance is so bad that I'd be afraid that he'd fall, that he'd be humiliated. It's there. The stories are there. They're not good at telling stories. You need to draw them out of them. You need to learn the stories. And when they tell you a great story, give them a big kiss and say, don't ever forget that, because when, you, when you're on the stand, and when I ask you about your dreams and your father and how you feel, you want to tell that story. I, uh, I was a somewhat inferior student my first couple of years in college. And I had a, uh, a professor who <laughs> wasn't even a professor of mine. But for some reason, this guy sought me out at the, in the uh, uh, coffee shop and told me he was going to make me a good student. I said, you know, I dare you. And he gave me the best advice I've ever had. He said, here, read this paragraph. I said, OK, I've read it. He said, underline the sentence that is the most important sentence in this paragraph. So I underlined. He said, what's the key word that explains this paragraph? I said, well, that's the word. He said, circle it. I circle it. He said, now you notice, if you came back to this paragraph next week, you'd glance at it, you'd see the sentence, you'd see the word, and it's right back with you. Um, 
And then I became a good student. I do that with magazines now. Um, the, what I do at least, you know, everyone has to find their own way. Um, I underline the depositions in different colors. Um, you know, highlighter for the most important key words, red for what's next important, blue for what's somewhat important. And uh, so when you glance at the deposition, at the copy of it, you've got these layers of distinction. The key things come jumping out at you. And you can find stuff quickly. Uh, I dictate a summary of each deposition where, you know, page on this line, the key words here from, from, from what's on the page. And, uh, and then from this dictate a direct examination. Um, the person who does the greatest direct examinations I've ever seen is uh, a relatively new lawyer, and that's my son, Jason. And uh, uh, he goes through every question on direct with the witness, beginning to end. He has highlighted in the deposition every bad answer they gave, and they work especially on those until they get them right. No, here's how to answer it. Go through it until they can do the whole direct testimony from beginning to end. He had a case where uh, three uh, African-American guys were uh, harassed and tormented by the police in a, uh, in a parking structure at 2 in the morning when the police were frustrated because it was, it was uh, St. Patty's night and everybody's drunk and driving all over the sidewalks and the streets and they're just foot cops and they can't do anything about it. And they, they singled these guys out and they found them up there and what they thought were alone and they pointed guns at their heads and they terrorized them and finally let them go. Um, and so here you had one of these guys had, uh, had been to college. The other two uh, were relatively unsophisticated. And these are not guys who'd ever been required to explain something that, that took an hour and had a whole number of different things happening all at once to them, to others. You know, it's quite a scene. And of course, since what they say is entirely different from what the police says, you got to have all three of these guys on the same page. And Jason did an examination. He spent like nine hours with these three guys. And at trial, he did his direct. The city attorney did a cross. And the redirect examination consisted of nothing for any of those three. Uh, if you work at it enough, you can reach something close to perfection. The, the client has to have a sense of what the themes are. Um, no matter how badly one is hurt, the jurors don't just want to hear a story that's a downer. They want to hear about somebody who's doing what they can with what they have left to salvage all they can and to make as much of a life for themselves as, as the circumstances allow. Um, nobody wants to hear about someone who is defeated. It happens, and sometimes you acknowledge it. But basically, you've got somebody who's struggling against adversity, and that's what juries want to hear. Um, it is easy for people to get angry, and you want to find that if it's there, if, if the client wants revenge, which is human and understandable, they have to be taught that that's, that's personal. It's not something that the jury can relate to. They may understand it, but they don't want in on it. It's the injustice where the jury can step in and write the end to this story, write a happy end to this story, restore the balance in the universe. Restore justice where there is none. But if it's personal, they don't want any part of it. So they have to be able to convey that this is more in sorrow than in anger. I prefer to call the plaintiff last, simply because that way they can't be blindsided by whatever, whatever else may happen in, the, in, in their case in chief. Spend some time on your client's appearance, you know? Make them dress and come to see you for trial before trial. Um, long ago, I didn't put this in my notes, but since it occurs to me, uh, long ago, my erstwhile partner and I 
had a uh, gal who was, who was accused of prostitution. And she, uh, she came to see us for, for a trial. She was wearing kind of a light summer cotton thing. And um, she was enormously buxom. And the thing was about as low cut as it could possibly be. So we went into this panic. And uh, at about quarter to nine, we fumbled around for something that could assist. And, and we came up with a stapler. <laughs> and we took the bottom of it. We pulled it up here and we stapled the hell out of it and held our breath for the next eight hours. <laughs> Don't let that happen to you, okay? <laughs> um, there are witnesses who are capable of counterpunching. And you usually find that out, not through any brilliance of your own, but because they just have the gift and they do it. I had a guy with a... Uh, a non-surgical uh, but very serious back injury. And he, uh, he'd done everything in the world to try and get well, including something called aromatherapy, where you get in a hot bathtub and have these candles that smell and so on. And, and the defense lawyer, Jay Chalk, was, was kind of needling him and kind of mocking him about aromatherapy, you know, kind of smirking about it. And finally, the guy just looks at him and he says, you know, Mr. Chalk, you can make light of a spinal injury if you want. And as you know, there's, there's nothing I can do about it. And that was 15 years ago, and Jay remembers that to this day because it, um, it destroyed his case. Um, Rashika Herring, the one uh, American medical response client who went to trial, um, I didn't prepare her as well as I wanted because I was strung out and exhausted, even though she was my most important witness. And uh, there was one portion of her deposition which was troublesome, and I meant to talk to her about it, but I didn't. But she had her own copy of the deposition. And uh, uh, the defense lawyer, James Dumas, um, picked at it like a scab, and, uh, and she looked at him and she said, well, Mr. Dumas, if you'll read further down on that page, you'll see that I explained it this way. And there was this... Uh, skinny little kid on the jury who was really alienated. And during the voir dire, he'd said, I just want to say that this is the most excruciatingly boring thing I've ever sat through. So we knew he was going to be a tough nut. And when, 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 when Rashika got off the mat and just leveled this guy, he just leaned forward and went, yeah! <laughs> Um, you can talk to the client about how they got to look at the jury, but they're likely to forget. Tell them how to do it. Brief, inobtrusive looks at the people, sort of one by one, when it feels right. Don't linger, but you know, don't look at the lawyer. And when they violate that, you move behind the jury. You get over here. So they can't look at you they, without, seeing, without looking the juror's direction. I think it's helpful to always have a podium. Um, it, it, you know, sort of gives you a place to, to, to make your mark, and you can position yourself without awkwardness. Um, if a witness is really bad, and you, you, you're not having control of them during your direct exam, get close to them. Because when you get close to them, you're taking over. And the jury's going to be looking at you. Ask the leading questions. You'll draw an objection or two. But believe me, the defense lawyers get tired of objecting, and they know the jurors don't like it. And pretty much you can ask leading questions till the cows come home. And uh, sometimes it's necessary. If it is, if that's what it takes to get control, go ahead and do it. And then when you have a witness who is off the chart perfect, Robert Darby's daughter. Robert Darby was the best dressed man I ever saw. He was an uh, elegant African American man, about 60. He uh, uh, was uh, blind, and he ha had a courageous story. He had, he had raised his two daughters in diapers alone while going to law school. 
and uh, he had a job at the IRS uh, answering questions over the phone about tax law, people calling in. And he was on his way to uh, uh, across uh, Broadway at Yam Hill to go to the haberdashers to get another fancy hat. And he had his white cane, and he walked straight and tall and proud and magnificent man. Well, PPNL had taken off the manhole cover in the middle of that crosswalk and surrounded it with three or four cones, red-orange cones, as the worker explained, to give it visibility. <laughs> Darby was walking along, and one of the witnesses said it was, it was like Alice in Wonderland. He just went right down the rabbit hole. The rabbit hole. And his feet caught on a ladder, which went from the, the basement some 11 feet down, flipped him and landed, on, landed him on his head. He had brain injury. He had PTSD. Explained to the jurors that the great fear that every blind person has is that they will step into a, into a bottomless pit. And that with Robert Darby, that fear is there with every step he takes. His daughter got on the stand, and I said, tell us the ways in which your father has changed. And she started talking. And I just got up and walked to the back of the room. Made myself disappear because she went into a stream of consciousness looking straight ahead and just kept talking. And then the tears started pouring down her face. And I swear to God, it must have lasted 10 minutes. I don't think anyone in the room took a breath. There are witnesses like that. Get out of their way. Always use simple questions. Avoid bureaucratic language. These damn young lawyers want to talk about vehicles, you know? Individual. There's no such thing as a vehicle. There's cars and there's trucks. There's no such thing as an individual. There's men and there's women, all right? Bureaucratic language is designed to create social distance because the bureaucrats hate you and don't want you to bother them, and they want to make you to go away, and so they give you gibberish. Cops talk that way. Don't, don't get sucked in ever. Talk to witnesses like you talk to jurors, like you're talking to a child, an intelligent, perhaps precocious child. Use language when you speak of damages Use languages, the kind of language that you'd find in a country music song. <clears throat> Things that are close to the bone, language of longing, betrayal, and loss. Talk to people about what they used to love doing, why they loved it, how they feel about not being able to do it anymore. Make sure your clients understand that anger is always a turnoff. Nobody wants to join in your anger. As so many have said, when you have bad facts on your side, get them out as early as possible so the cross-examination is disarmed. Get your bad stuff out through your witness. George Bernard Shaw said that to understand all is to forgive all. Find a way to like your client. <laughs> Ask enough to understand. Learn about your client. I had a, I had a uh, African American gal. She was false arrest case, and the defense lawyer must have questioned her for 15 minutes. And it's because he's got this picture in his mind: a oh, large black girl. You know, they're all the same kind of a thing. And 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 just had no sense of who she was when he finished his, his, uh, his examination. Uh, she would graduated from Oregon State. She'd gone there on a basketball scholarship. She had a story. She had a life. He didn't know any of it. I did. So I could put the, I could put the case on. Learn about your client. Try to, try to avoid stereotypes. Try and find the decency 
at their heart so that you can, you can show it, and you can make others understand it, and make them appreciate the injustice that's been done to them. I, uh, I usually end the direct examination of the plaintiff with a long pause, and then without letting them know that the question is coming, I just say something like, uh, we've talked a lot today about what happened, what happened to you and how things are different. Tell the jury, looking back on all this, how do you feel about what happened to you? You'd be amazed how good people are when they just have a chance to answer that question. Now they're, they're done. They've been beaten down and threatened and scared and, and resisted attempts to be bought off. And now they just have one last chance to talk to somebody about how they feel about the whole goddamn thing and what it meant to them to have to go through it and, and, and facing the rest of their life. Trust them. The last thing I want to mention is uh, I had a case. I lost my cases for the first 17 years. I didn't, uh, I didn't win a case worth calling my parents and telling them about it. And then I had a case that I thought was a great, great case about an environmental activist who'd, uh, who'd stood up to uh, powerful forces and, and, and been crushed by them. And, uh, and I, I took the story to uh, to Eldon Rosenthal. And uh, so I started with Eldon. I'll end with him. And he must have given me an hour to, to tell this story about going to trial in a couple of weeks. And, and he listened to it for the longest time. And then he said, geez, you know, I'm sorry, Greg, but I just don't think it's a big case. And I walked out of there, and I was just crestfallen. And then I said to myself, He's wrong. It is a big case. It's a big case because I know it's a big case. And if I know it's a big case, that means it is a big case. And if I believe it, they're going to believe it. And I'm going to make them believe it. And we won almost a million dollars. And so when you look at the story about what the taxi driver said to me, which brought me down a little off my perch about the defense lawyer who misunderstood that the jury hated me and, uh, and hate him and lived for that for, 20, for, 20, for 25 years. <laughs> and the story about Eldon not picking up on what I saw in a case. In all that you do, don't listen to all that. Certainly not to me. Trust yourself. Because justice is in here. It's in you, in every one of you. And if you believe there is justice there, you can make others believe it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much.